All right, let's pray. Jesus, we ask for your help in this area of life. Um, as we're going through this book, Make Today Count, this is one of the first things and, uh, that we need to address. It's chapter one, because it's a very important topic. It's the area of attitude. So I pray, Lord, that you'd give me strength to uh, speak your word in a faithful way and in a way that allows us to be focused on the areas that we need to improve and help us to celebrate the areas that we might have victory in this area. But all of us in this room, myself included, can do a better job of being aware of our attitude and using it for good and not for bad. And so help us, Holy Spirit, to learn from your word, learn from our life, and learn from the lives of others. And I pray that we would leave this place excited to apply what we've learned in ways that bring you glory. We pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, if you look at the top of your notes, um, you'll see a bunch of different things. But when we were here last um, show, we talked about the, the gift that light is. And we talked about that we're in a very dark time in history. And it's, a, it's in the darkness that we recognize light for being what it is. And so this was a picture of a sunrise and the, the blessing of seeing um, darkness become light. And if you've had the privilege of seeing many sunrises, which I have, and I'm sure many of you have, it brings hope. And so there's an idea that goes with that. And we talked about these as object lessons. I had lots of different lights that we put up here last time. We had an oil lamp. We had the room almost completely dark. And just the reality of light used to be slow. We live in a very fast paced um, culture, but light used to be slow because you had to light all the lanterns in your dwelling to actually light up the house at night. But now you just flick a switch and everything's really fast. And because everything's fast, we tend to live that kind of pace in each and every of our days. And so if you think about this area of light and darkness and you think about the area of attitude, here's where we're gonna kind of land. This is right at the top of your notes. And Psalm 1, we talked about last time that blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. Wise is the person who walks with God. God will change your attitude better than anybody. He will humble you stronger than anybody, but he'll also love you stronger than anybody. And so if you have uh, purchased this book, this is the book that we're going to go through throughout this uh, year of making today count because you can get overwhelmed right now with all the stuff that's going on in the world. You can get overwhelmed in such a way that you just don't even, you almost like freeze up and you're like, you do nothing. And one of the things that you should, and I hope through this series, pray about God, I'm frustrated today, or God, I'm dealing with this today. Help me find a way to make today count. So if you're uh, an academician and you love studying and you're, you're into that focus, or you're into music or you're into athletics, one of the things that you want to do to get better is you make each and every day count because it makes you better in all of those areas. But if you're lazy in any of those areas, as you know, you can backpedal your life. You can actually go backwards. And so in this area of attitude, look at the first quote I've given you, and it's right up here on the screen. It says, you'll never change your life until you change something you do daily. You see, success doesn't just suddenly occur one day in someone's life. For that matter, neither does failure. Each is a process. Every day of your life is merely preparation for the next. In other words, you're preparing for something. The next one is, this is a famous quote that John Maxwell will say a lot that his dad told him growing up. He basically said, son, you can pay now and play later, or you can play now and pay later. Either way, you're going to pay. So what you see is you see a lot of people, because I've been working with your age bracket a long time, you see a lot of people who say, I don't need an education. I don't need to work hard. I'm just going to play and party. And I'm going to party hard. I'm going to destroy my character. I'm going to destroy my reputation. I'm going to expect people to respect me, even though my behavior doesn't dem demonstrate it. And then I want a good job. I want a person to employ me, even though I'm not trustworthy, I'm kind of negative and I'm lazy. Well, the fact of the life is this. If you want a healthy farm, guess what? You got to do the work to work the land. But if you work the land early enough, you can work that and work that and work that in a way that as you get older, you don't have to work as hard because now you just manage everything. But if you play around and are lazy and not focused in the earlier years of your life and you have a bad attitude, you know what you're going to do? You're going to work for people the rest of your life who tell you what to do. You'll never be your own boss. You'll never have freedom and you'll basically be miserable. 
all because your attitude when you were young was cocky, arrogant, and lazy. It's extremely predictable. I've seen it many, many times. But through humble people, people who have a good attitude and make good choices, God uses that to leverage each day and they start getting momentum. And it's a joy for me as one of your pastors to see that momentum build. And so you'll see this next quote. It's a quote I've said to uh, my family and to leadership many years. Um, The choices you make today affect the options you have tomorrow, so choose wisely. We live in a world that thinks you can do anything you want, say anything you want, and still have whatever you want. It's a lie. It's a flat out lie. If you make certain choices in your behavior and your attitude, if they're good choices, these doors are open to you. If they're bad choices, a good employer has no interest in hiring you because you're going to be too much work. And so the reality of this is, is such that we went through a lot of different things. And one of the things that we talked about briefly last week in the last show was life math. And so this idea of good decisions minus daily discipline leads a plan without a payoff. But if you have daily discipline, you're very focused, but you don't make good decisions. You have regiment, you have rules, but without a reward. And then you have good decisions and daily discipline. If you do the two together and the dance that requires it, your life becomes like a masterpiece. God can make it this beautiful masterpiece that not only blesses you, but blesses a lot of people around you. And so the reality of attitude is very important because this next quote, before I highlight a couple things and we flip the page over, it basically is this. It seems obvious that good decisions help to create a better tomorrow, yet many people don't appear to connect that their lack of success to their poor decision making. Some people make choices then experience negative consequences, yet wonder why they can't seem to get ahead. I can confirm that. I've seen that. And there's people who make excuses. Well, you know, this didn't work out because of this. And this didn't work out because of this. And they don't see the common denominator. The common denominator is your attitude is terrible. Everywhere they go, they complain. Everywhere they go, they find reasons why it didn't work rather than actually doing the work and making it work hard. And if you've ever prepared for anything, whether it's a test or a production in a, in a song that you're going to play on a piano, or a game that you've trained, whether it's soccer, football, basketball, whatever it is, if you've trained hard, guess what? You're excited for game day because you've prepared with the right attitude of working hard. You haven't been lazy. But if you've been lazy and like I complain and all stuff, I love playing against teams that complained a lot. I knew I was going to win almost every time I won. Because if I can get the opponent to complain against each other, we're going to win because they're going to defeat themselves. And so in the reality of all of these things, I want you and I to recognize complaining takes no skill. It's the idea that I can, I can train a defender much quicker in soccer than I can a person who scores goals. You know why? You, you know why pitchers get paid so much money? Okay, the Brewers are playing right now. You know why they get paid so much money? You know why quarterbacks get paid so much money? Do you know why these, these playmakers make a ton of money? Because they have crafted ability to create in a way that makes them talented. But to destroy doesn't take a ton of work, but it also takes quite a bit of skill to be able to read the people that create. And so there's this idea that you and I could, could live, and he talks about it in his book. Many of you may know the Peanuts uh, cartoon, uh, the famous Charlie Brown Christmas special. But one of the characters in that cartoon is Lucy. And Lucy has a gift in her cartoon character of complaining. She's always complaining, okay? And so here's one clip. He says, here's five good reasons not to bother me today. Basically, she's making a fist. So there's this idea that you can be around people. And what I want you to ask yourself before we get into some of the detail of all this, how would people describe your attitude? How would people describe your ability to focus? Some of you are doing real well right now and some of you not so much. So this is your warning. I'm here to help you. But if you're going to distract other people from learning, I'll do what I've always done. I'll just point to you and a leader will take you to the hall. I'm not here to waste my time. Hopefully you aren't either. So the reality of attitude is this. Has everything to do with focus. Picture your attitude like the steering wheel. For those of you who are blessed to have your license. Okay? When you first drive for the first time, you realize I'm in control of this vehicle. Kind of freaks you out, okay? 
And if you've ever been in a tight situation driving through Illinois and construction and you're sitting here, let me give you a tip of something that keeps you safe. Because typically if you're driving through Illinois, there's all these orange, orange barrels and construction is kind of narrow. The lanes are narrow. One of the things that you do to play defense driving is, you know what you do? You don't look at the other person's steering wheel. You look at their front wheels. When I'm in those situations, a lot of times I drive and I look at my Past the person to my right or to my left, I look at their front wheels, wheels because you know why? They're going to dictate where they're going. They're going to basically go this way and they'll drift. And if I can see their front wheels drifting this way or if I see them this way, I compensate to protect my family or to protect the people I'm in the car with. Your attitude is something you have to protect because how you steer it is critical to the health of your life and the health of other people looking forward to seeing you or avoiding you. You know what that dictates? It's your attitude. People are going to be excited to see you if you are an encourager, if you're a person who's positive. They're not going to be excited to see you if you're the person who highlights all their negative aspects and you're critical and you're just kind of complaining all the time. And if you own a company someday, I guarantee you, you're not going to be eager to hire such a person because they're going to take a lot of work. But you're going to look above and beyond for the person who's positive. So you'll see at the bottom of your notes, these are a couple of things that he talks about. These are headlines um, in this first chapter. I'm not going to go through everything that he talks about because hopefully you read it. But he talks about taking responsibility for your attitude. Decide to change your bad attitude areas. You have to be aware of where you kind of lose it sometimes. Number three, think, act, talk, and conduct yourselves like the person you want to become. Part of having a good attitude is discovering how you want people to describe you. And if you want people to describe you as joyful and encouraging, well, try to choose those words. Try to choose those body language um, reading things. Because you've all been in a room where you see someone, you've heard them, you've not heard them speak, you've not really interacted with them, but you just read their body language and they are ticked off. You're like, do not, do not talk to them. Maybe you've seen your mom or your dad in that mood when they get, you get home from a long day and you read and you're like, I was going to ask a question, but I don't think I'm going to ask the question today. Because you're like, eh, it's not a good idea. Okay. Body language, attitude, countenance can communicate a lot of information. And you don't realize that sometimes you think, well, I'm smiling and you're not smiling. Well, right now I can't tell if anybody's smiling, but the reality is your, your body will communicate. And so be that person you have to think about. And number four, place a high value on people. And five, develop a high appreciation for life. Then he goes on managing the discipline. He talks about recognizing that your attitude needs daily adjustment. We all have adjustments we have to make, and I'm going to give you some tips on that on the back page. Number two, find something positive in everything. Find something positive in every situation, and find something positive to say in every conversation, which is hard to do in today's world and all that we're experiencing. And then you see in this particular section, these negative words that he wants you to um, basically eliminate from your vocabulary. Do your best to avoid saying, I can't, and transferring it to, I can do your best to say, if only to, I will, or I don't think to, I know. And you can read all the way down the list. The words you use impact how you become successful. I remember one of my coaches, one of the guys I played soccer with, he, he, could, he was known for co uh, juggling a thousand times. Then he got to 10,000. And someone said to me, hey, Case, you like soccer. You think you'll juggle a thousand? And my, my words were not wise. I said, there's no way. I can't do that. Guess what? I never learned how to do it until I finally changed my vocabulary. I said, you know what? I got to 100. If I can get to 100, I can get to 1,000. And so sure enough, I could juggle 1,000. And I didn't want to juggle 10,000 because it's kind of boring. Okay? But maybe I could have. I've never tried. But I just sat there and juggled to 1,000 because I changed my vocabulary and I changed my focus. So you might think for a second, hey, I can't do that. Well, you've already defeated yourself. Maybe you can. You just don't know it yet. And so the reality of life is we have to be mindful of these things. Flip the page over. This is where it gets a little interesting. When you and I think about these things, this is part of your object lesson. When you're a kid, wasn't it a great thing that you had like this huge box of crayons? Maybe you got like the mother load box. There's like a really big box of crayons. It's pretty sweet. And when you're a little kid, it's awesome. You'll sit there with a blank sheet of paper and you'll color these. And then if it's a really good day, mom or dad will put it on the fridge. You're like, man, I made the fridge. That's awesome. And so you get there. Here's what's interesting about coloring. 
I did, a, I did a whole thing in undergrad when I was a psych major at Madison. I did a whole thing. They had all these kind of depressing studies that they had us do. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. Could I do a study on this? They're like, well, that's kind of interesting. That'd be fun. Are you, are you willing to do that? How will you measure? I said, well, I'll do it this way, this way, this way. So I designed this whole way of measuring how happy people were based on their colors. So here's what I did. I had them take a test on just overall questions. Your overall mood in life is what? And then they fill it out fill out all these questions. And then I gave him a blank sheet of paper and I said, hey, there's just one more part of this test. Here's a whole bunch of crayons. Pick any colors you want and just color a picture of yourself today or when you were a kid. It was amazing to see the correlation of the people who had a negative image of themselves and how dark the colors they chose to color the picture of themselves. Their attitude was, I have no value. I'm always being yelled at. I have a negative view on life. And so they picked really dark colors that were not very expressive or joyful. And then you had some people that they just had joy on their face and they were expressive in their life. They had a very positive attitude. They answered the questions really solid. And then you'd go look at their pictures and their pictures were bright and they were very cheery and it was exciting to see. And the correlation was unbelievable. And my professor and these people were like, man, Case, this is, this is pretty impressive because I had to quantify and all this stuff. I want to ask you the question, if you were to color your life right now, what colors would they be? Because only you can change what colors you color with. I can sit up here and preach and teach and tell you how much I love you and how much Jesus loves you. But if you're not willing to love yourself and say that you get to change your attitude, I can't, I can't do anything beyond what I'm doing right now. You have an opportunity to reinvent yourself every day. Don't let people put you in a box of like, this is your ceiling. This is how you have to behave. Your attitude is your responsibility. What you take into everything is your responsibility. So the colors are important. And so here's what I want you to think about. Look at the top of your notes. You'll see some quotes. I don't have time to get through all those, but you can look at them. There's some of them are pretty, pretty solid. Um, attitudes are contagious. Are yours worth catching? It's an anonymous quote, but it's a pretty good quote. You'll see in the scripture, there's one particular scripture that I want us to focus on tonight. And it's this scripture from Philippians 4. Um, in this area, I've given you a couple fill in the blanks um, in this area. And so as you and I think about it, um, you'll see whatever is true. It says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, meaning whatever is honest and credible, correct and trustworthy. Those are the things, you, what you think with your attitude, the Bible says, here's a good idea. If you want to get healthy, think about these things. And it's interesting that the list starts with what's true. Because the quickest way that you can go to a bad attitude is being lied to. I don't know about you, but I don't like being lied to. I want to start with what's true. So then if I start with what's true and what's honest, guess what? Then I'm going to pursue what's noble. And noble is something that's respectable, it's honorable. It's the right thing. You're doing the right thing at the right time for the right reason. Whatever is right, you're doing what's correct and it's justice and it's righteousness. Whatever is pure, it's holy without blemish. It's spirit guided, not sin guided. So if you're going to do what's pure, you're going to do what God says is pure and you're going to seek to be maybe cast aside from your friends, but you're going to be living faithful to Christ and that alone will give you a stronger attitude. It'll allow you to not be so insecure as a person that you can't possibly compliment anybody. Insecure people cannot compliment other people because they're always threatened by them. So people who have a positive attitude and are secure in Christ have the security in such a way that they have the courage to compliment other people. It's one of the ways you can see a believer is becoming mature or a person is becoming mature in a good attitude. They have the ability to compliment their teammates, the ability to compliment their teachers, their peers, and not feel threatened. But if you see people constantly being critical and condemning other people, you know what they're telling you? They're insecure. They have to tear other people down to feel good. It's the only way they feel good. So attitude's a critical piece. And then you'll see whatever is lovely, meaning delightful, pleasing, whatever is admirable, greatly appreciated, valor, and excellent, the pinnacle point, very best, virtuous. So gentlemen, one of the things I want to highlight to you is we go into the fall retreat. We're going to have some sign up coming up. We're going to train you a little bit on what these things are because a godly man, when he rightly understands following Christ, he can walk into any room at any time and actually be confident. And any man in this room wants to be known as a confident man. And if you don't, I'll pray for you. I hope you grow into that. 
but no woman's looking forward to standing next to a coward. I've yet to meet a woman that says, oh, you want to see my man? This is my man. He's the biggest coward I know. So proud of him. Such a stallion. Okay. No, a woman wants to feel proud to stand next to a man who actually knows who he is so that he can compliment his bride. He can set her up to win. He can set everybody else in the room up to win because his attitude is Christ-centered. He's living on what's true, what's noble, what's right. He actually is embodying the truth of what Christ wants a follower of Christ to be. And that's compelling to women. It's gonna be attractive. But to men, sometimes it's a threat. Men don't like other men who sometimes are confident in who they are. And so the idea is very, very important. This attitude adjustment is critical for all of us. And so as we think about these things and wrestle with them, I want to remind you, you and I have that opportunity. It says, I'm, I gave up trying to understand people long ago. Now I'm letting them try to understand me. Selfish people say that. Selfish people say that. They do it all the time. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a couple of fill in the blanks. Then we're going to close in prayer. When you start your morning, I'm going to give you some tips on how to adjust your attitude. I'm going to give you practical stuff, okay? Just practical stuff. Number one, when you wake up out of bed, your first words are critical. They cannot be complaining words. They have to be positive. I will tell you a story that convicted me a long time ago. I was at a, um, in my former youth group, we brought a whole bunch of breakfast to this homeless shelter. We almost didn't bring it because we almost had to cancel it. It was negative 15 degrees below zero the night before. So we think, am I going to bring students to this? Am I not? I'm like, you know what? We're going to do that. These people were sleeping on the streets last night. We can go to the homeless shelter and bring them breakfast. So we bring them breakfast. And sure enough, this guy gets up front. And this guy says, I am just so, he says, I woke up this morning praising the Lord I was alive. And then praising the Lord I was going to see all of you because I knew this group was bringing breakfast. Isn't it a great day? And I'll tell you what, I was under great conviction because I had woken up in my home with heat. I had beautiful blanket over me all night. I actually stepped on carpet, was able to use a bathroom that was heated. And I didn't say that when I woke up. Those weren't my first words. God used this homeless man to convict me and it's changed my life ever since. One sentence this guy said, I make the choice in the beginning of my day to praise the Lord for another day and find something positive to say. So your first words cannot be, oh, I can't believe the alarm went off. Oh, this day is going to stink. It's going to be terrible. You haven't even gotten out of bed and you've already started the path of what else can I look for that stinks? Yeah, that stinks over there. That stinks over there. And then you at the end of the day, wonder why the day stunk. I don't know. So the idea of first words are important. Second one, Freak your parents out. This will freak them out if you do this. First people you see. So first words, positive words. First people, smile and encourage them. Freak your parents out. If you groan and grumble all the morning every day, freak them out tomorrow and smile and say, hey, good morning, mom. Thanks for making breakfast. Hey, good morning, dad. How are you doing? Did you get a good night's sleep? Encourage them. They might fall over. You might have to pick them up, okay? but find a way to encourage them. And for those of you who've been on international mission trips with me or retreats with me, you know I seek to live this out because when I see you in the line at breakfast or the first time I see you, do I complain to you? I do not because I know by complaining to you, I'm just going to make the whole day more difficult for all of us. We find a way to praise God for something that's good. So the first people you see, you have a responsibility to bring praise into that as much as you possibly can. And then thirdly, First project, find something you can do to finish and feel good about finishing it. Because when you do that, you feel a sense of accomplishment and automatically it helps your attitude. So first words need to be positive. The first people you see need to be positive and encouraging. That doesn't mean the second and third person you scream at, okay? It means you keep trying to be positive and encouraging in such a way that you start your day strong. One of the ways that you and I can do that is in the bad weather like we can occasionally have in Wisconsin, one of the ways that you can do that is you can jokingly say it sarcastically, whoa, it's a beautiful day out. You know what you do? You make people smile in your house because they're like, they know it's not a beautiful day. It's horizontal rain and it's 30 degrees, okay? Or, or 35 degrees just above snow. 
And so you'll say, hey, isn't it a beautiful day out? And you'll make some people smile or laugh or whatever. And it just kind of stages, it changes the atmosphere of the room, okay? Next part, when you and I get to this part of halfway through the day, here's one of the things you need to do. Ask yourself these three questions. How is my attitude thus far? By reflecting on where your attitude is, you can make adjustments as needed. Have you been going into the direction of being grumpy? Do your best to take a commercial break. One of the things that I'll do is I'll go to a place and I'll try to pray. Or I'll go to a place and I can listen to one of my favorite songs that maybe will pick me up a little bit. Or I'll try to think of something funny, okay? And all of these different little simple things you can do will change how you handle things. Number two, who can I help encourage? One of the quickest ways to get out of a grumpy, bad mood is to find someone that you can encourage. Well, you're thinking right now, oh, that's great, Pastor Case. I'm, I'm, I'm in a grumpy mood, and so I'm now going to go encourage other people? That's not going to work. I need them to encourage me. The Bible says he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. When you refresh other people, the Holy Spirit uses that to encourage you as you encourage someone else. And you'd be surprised. There have been people I've encouraged when I've been really frustrated that all of a sudden God uses that same person to encourage me on a day that I'm really down. And they don't know how much they encourage me, but it's just God's sense of humor to say, you know what? I know you did something for that person on a day you didn't want to. Now that person is doing something for you on a day that you really need it. And so that whole part just helps you in ways that you can't understand. And thirdly, How is my attitude impacting my life? You and I have to be honest with the direction of where we're going. If you want to be grumpy all the time, well then get used to not having a lot of friends, not staying employed, and a whole bunch of other problems that go with it. I can almost predict that you will not stay happily married if you even stay married. And I'll go through all the list. Grumpiness takes no skill. Joyful attitudes and positive encouraging attitudes takes great skill. Great patience. But one of the best ways you can learn how to do that is to pray. Be known as a person of prayer because God will will love you in a way that allows you to love other people because you can be an ambassador for Christ. You're a representative of him in the world once you trust him as your savior. And lastly, you'll see as you get to the end of the day, here's three things you can do. Um, Again, we've got a little clip of uh, Lucy. Went to McDonald's to order a happy meal. Didn't work, still grumpy, okay? There's some people you give them a happy meal, they're still like, well, it doesn't come with the toy I want. This whole meal stinks, okay? They get into that mode, all right? Be careful of those people. I would challenge you to try to love them, but I'd stay away from them. I try to stay away from negative people. I just have learned in my life, it's just not worth the energy. They they can just suck me down fast. And so you don't want to be that person. You want to be the person that hopefully builds people up. Lastly, you'll see the last thing, praises from the day. One of the best ways to end your day is to have a positive attitude like, Lord, what are some things I can thank you for today? I guarantee you that homeless man sat there and said, you know what? I had a great day. Woke up on a freezing cold night, but I started the day with a warm breakfast with a youth group that told me about the love of Jesus Christ. That probably was one of his praises because I spent some time talking to that guy and that guy humbled me. God used that simple guy to change my life in a pretty profound way. And so God could use your life. Think of how many times God could use your life to impact people in a profound way just because you carry yourself differently in the area of attitude. The next one, this is really important. To reflect, retool, to live with resolve. Part of reflecting on the day, you do it so that you can take like a Sabbath moment to think what went well, what didn't go well, so that I can retool and not make the same mistake tomorrow. I'll have more resolve on how I handle that. So a good example would be if someone did something negative and you also joined in, recognize I don't want to do that tomorrow. Next time I'm going to say a positive comment about that friend that everybody's ripping on. They're all ripping on her. They're all ripping on him. I'm not going to join in on the bandwagon like I did today. That was a mistake. I'm going to say, hey, you know what? I've always liked this about them. And as soon as you do that, you can change an entire conversation with a group of people and you can bring them under conviction and change your heart and change theirs. And lastly, this is a a fun factor, um, projects for tomorrow. One of the things you can do is prep your project, like something you're looking forward to so that when you wake up in the morning, you're excited to get up. You've got some things you want to work on. That alone will also help your attitude. If you think about it in your life when you're excited, how many of you are dragging out of bed on Christmas morning? You're probably not. And if you are, you need help, okay? 
Christmas morning is super fun. It's exciting. You know it's a day of celebration. You know it's a day that you're going to have fun with your family and friends, all that kind of stuff. You're excited. If there's something you've been looking forward to in the summer, a project or something, you're excited. You get up quicker. Find something to keep dreaming because if you keep improving your attitude and keep improving things, guess what? You're excited to wake up and start another day because you've made today count. And if you make today count in your attitude, I promise you, God's going to keep using you because there's not enough positive, joyful people in the world. And if there's a time we need that, it's right now. A lot of people are hurting. When you see an elderly person leaving the grocery store, I know you can't help them with their groceries, but you can smile at them. You can say, that's a really pretty dress. You can just do whatever it is to encourage them, at least acknowledge them. And I promise you, as you do that, God will boost your attitude and you just boosted a person that you may never see again. But you're showing the love of Christ to them. And it's a way that God gets much glory. So here's my final question to you as we close. What colors are you coloring in your life? Are you coloring in such a way that God gets much glory? Or are you coloring in such a way that people just see a bunch of dark colors and very negative and really have no interest in following you anywhere? Because one of the things that people did with Jesus, they followed him everywhere. As we're going to learn Sunday, do not miss Sunday. We're going to do some really cool stuff Sunday. Crowds and crowds and crowds of people were following him because there was something captivating about his love, captivating about his life, and that captivating attitude that he had to love people well. So as I close us in prayer and Jamie comes up and we're going to close in prayer, start a worship set, but the worship set we're going to start is a little different. Um, we're going to pray a little bit for our nation. This past Saturday, we had a national prayer day and uh, we did this for middle school. Jamie's going to lead you and talk a little bit about it, but it's the idea that as we pray, we need to pray for our nation right now. In all the years I've been alive, I've never seen our, our country so divided and so dark and we need God's help and we need to be a part of that help in the communities that he puts us in. So let's pray, and then the team will lead us. Father, I pray that you would lead us and guide us individually, as a youth group, as families, that we would do our part to have a good attitude, Jesus. We need your help. There's times our attitude is terrible. There's times our attitude we, we sense is just so joyful that we are being impacted and we're impacting other people. Father, help us to be mindful that our attitude is our responsibility that we can't pin it off on somebody else. We have to be responsible. And as we come before you and worship, and as we think about these things that you've given us to think about in your word and through the practical application of life, help us, Lord, to have a joyful attitude. Help us to freak out people tomorrow because we're so upbeat and positive, not in a way that's annoying and, and over the top, but a way that's genuine and that demonstrates your love living through our lives. So Father, be with us as we worship your name. And help us to leave this place finding ways to encourage people and not be so critical in a time we desperately need to be experiencing your love, your joy, and your peace. We pray these things in the powerful name of Christ and all God's people said.